So hello, I'm Adrian Ostrowski, I work at Havana Labs, and it's my pleasure to open the C++ track today with my talk uh, named C++, a fast tour of a fast language. So without further ado, let's move right into it. So today, what we will talk about is we will talk about the goods and the bads years of C++, uh, why the language currently thrives, what is and uh, why you should care about modern C++, how the language evolved and how the language ecosystem evolved with it. So let's start with a bit of history. So let's start with how it all started. Actually, so this, I, I guess you all know this uh, person. So this is Bjarne Struestrup, the creator of the language. And uh, it all started when he was writing his uh, doctor's dissertation. So he w it was about communication in distributed systems. And he was writing it in Simula, which is a language created before the Big Bang in 1967. It was a nice language because it gave uh, access to um, high-level abstractions, so it was good for writing big systems. Unfortunately, it came at a cost. Those abstractions uh, were costly, so he decided that this cost is too much for him and he needs to rewrite the um, code to a faster language. He chose BCPL, which was uh, close closer to assembly and didn't incur the performance overhead. Unfortunately, all the high-level abstractions from Simula were gone. So he didn't like it, and no wonder, uh, and decided that the next time he will have to deal with something similar, he will create a new tool better suited for it, maybe even a programming language. So. Oh, and, and uh, he says he lost most of his hair in the process of writing his dissertation. So then after um, having this, his PhD, he went to Bell Labs to work. It was in 1979. And one of his assignments was to work on uh, distributed computing in the Unix kernel. So he needed to, so he noticed that it's basically a very similar problem that he had worked on his, in his PhD, and decided this is a good moment to create a new tool. Uh, he decided to create a new language, and uh, he wanted to base it on something which was commonly used and fast at that, at that time, so he took the C language, created in 72, and added some features to it, cl like classes, that's why it was first named, the, the C++ was first named C with classes. And uh, the guys at Bell Labs really liked uh, creating languages, by the way, because they created B, C, BCPL, and C++, amongst any others. So he took uh, the abstractions from Simula, the performance of C, added some features from other languages, like Algo, for example, and created a new language. And the philosophy of C++ nowadays is still the same as it was when the language was created. So the main points are that there should be no place for a language between uh, C++ and the assembly. It's as close to the battle as it can be. It's, it also is important that you won't pay for the features that you don't use, so we only play, pay what, for what you use. And the abstractions should come at the lowest possible cost, possibly zero cost. Uh, sometimes it turns out the abstractions actually are higher performance than what they are abstracting, and this is called negative cost abstractions. So after several years of working on the language, in 73 it was renamed to C++ finally, then later, two years later, in 1985, uh, he released the book, the C++ programming language, which many people treat as the formal beginning of C++, the birth. A few years later, uh, in the 90s, still more features were added, and one of the most important features was templates, which were added in 91. 
And soon after, this uh, fella, uh, who knows who this guy is? Okay. Uh, so this is Alex Stepanov. He wrote a template library named STL. And uh, he used it at his company. He wasn't planning on moving it into the standard. Um, he had some talks with Andrew Koenig, who was his colleague at work. And Koenig tried to convince him that uh, proposing the STL to the standard library or to, to the C++ standard would be a good idea. Uh, and Stepanov said that, yeah, it's probably not going to be released anyway. It's not going to be accepted. Koenig argumented that, yeah, it won't be accepted if you won't propose it. And after he proposed it, in 1994, um, STL landed in the, in the standard C++. So this is a good example why you should write your own proposals if you, even if you, if, if you or someone else thinks it's a valuable addition to the standard. Uh, the 90s were also a time where the object-oriented prog programming was uh, on the rise. So C++ really shined, but uh, in those times it was used mainly as an object-oriented language with lots of virtual dispatch, um, RTTI, heavy RTTI usage and whatnot. Because uh, it, yeah, it, it was a good fit for that time. And at the end of the 90s, the first C++ standard was uh, released, C++ 98. With the rise of OOP in C++, there were also other object-oriented uh, languages uh, being created and uh, gaining popularity. Some of them are called the coffee-based languages, and uh, the, mm, the, they, they really became popular in the 2000s. So I'm talking, uh, for example, about Java or C Sharp here. And, uh, they had this advantage that they also allowed you to write object-oriented code, uh, while you could write it even faster in C++ because those languages aren't that complex. You don't have this many things to think about while developing. Uh, so this was really a hard time for C++. With the rise of the CPU speeds, it's... Uh, it wasn't really that important to have the highest performant language. But it turns out that uh, some new developments in hardware or in how software was developed helped the language. So one of the features or one of, one of the uh, important platforms for C++ became the mobile platforms. So here, not only raw performance was important, but performance per watt because everybody wants their smartphones to run long on battery. So this is a place for C++ code. And uh, since C++ apps usually have lower memory consumption than managed languages, uh, they are a better suit for this. And also they could be responsive even on uh, slower devices like the mobile phones. Another platforms, another important set of platforms are the cloud platforms. Here, the scale changed everything. So, if you took a, even a, if if you could squeeze even a small improvement out of C++ code or out of any code, it on a scale on a big scale like in the Amazon cloud or at Facebook uh, servers, it could scale up. Um, by much. So if you have one machine, it's not an important change. If you have ten, tens of thousands of machines, it really starts to save you money. So performance per watt is also important here because the main cost of running data centers is the mm, energy. So the watts. Uh, okay, and another platform for C++ when it still remains strong, are embedded platforms. On the left side, you have a video of Jason Turner from CppCon in 2017. 
I believe. And uh, this presentation was about writing a game for Commodore 64 in C++ 17. And uh, it ran smoothly, and he, he had to do some hops to make it run on this old hardware, but it still it was C++ 17. And on the right side, you have the Mars rover. <coughs> and um, it's also an important area where C++ is being used. So NASA really likes this language. Many mission-critical systems do. Some other fields where C++ is used with mission-critical is aeroplanes. And the areas where performance really does matter, so in game development, in high-frequency trading, uh, in open operating system development, uh, and uh, even recently as a building blocks for larger technologies. So if you develop a car or uh, some systems for the car in the automotive industry, C++ is heavily used. Also, from the recent trends, uh, machine learning is based on C++. So if you take TensorFlow, for example, it's uh, written in C++ under the Python layer. And blockchain, so for example, Bitcoin is also written in C++. And the language really does matter nowadays. So this is a mm, diagram from mm, IEEE Spectrum. It's a ranking of the programming language's popularity, let's say, and we see that it's still quite high on this rank. So it really does matter. Okay, so let's talk about what is modern C++, because we know what C++ is. But what, what do you think is modern C++? Does it depend on the standards you're using? So if you're using C++11, is this modern C++? Maybe you should move to um, 14 um, or 17. So it turns out C++ isn't, modern C++ isn't about the standard. It's more about the philosophy of how you code and uh, how you design your code. And, uh, oh sorry, and it turns out that uh, C++ was, modern C++ was started years before 11. Uh, so, um, C++ 11, which, was, which is uh, understood by many as the first modern C++ standard, is actually heavily influenced by libraries and practices that were taking place in the 2000s. So I have a question for you. Who knows which year this book is from? This oh, it's, it's uh, younger than 98. It's not that old, guys. So it's actually from 2001. And it's the book by Alexandrescu, who, which is uh, considered to be starting the modern C++ move. It's about... It's many of the, the things uh, that are said in this book are still stand by today. So how those two styles, the modern and old style, differ, mm, are different from each other? So modern C++ isn't afraid of uh, the RAII idiom, which means uh, resource acquisition is initialization. And uh, it's uh, mm, very useful for handling resources. Another thing of modern C++ is that it's, uh, it tries to reuse as much as possible. So you should probably first look if someone implemented something that you could at least adapt or write functions or components in a way that uh, could help you to achieve reuse. Templates and metaprogramming are a great way to achieve this. And uh, C++ also, modern C++ also likes mixing programming paradigms. So it's the opposite of the old C++, C++ style, which was all about manually handling resources, manual new deletes, reinventing the wheel, like writing uh, string implementations. And uh, it's, it, it isn't afraid to use 
even simple. So, 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 so the old style was afraid to use templates. And it was based on writing everything in orient orient object-oriented way, which isn't always necessary. Um, so let's talk about Rai first. So who of you ever leaked a resource? OK. And maybe some of you had trouble with double freeing a resource as well? OK. And uh, uh, how maybe some of you had a hard time with exceptions and resource handling? Yeah. So RAII really helps with this because it takes the burden of resource handling, handling from the programmer. And here's an example of this code. So we have a simple smart pointer, which is non-copyable. I will describe it in a bit. The important parts here are that uh, we pass it a pointer. Upon deletion, it will delete the pointer. And we have some member functions to uh, get the contents of the pointer. And the magic of this is, since it's not copyable, we aren't able to actually double free the resource because we won't copy this class, and we won't uh, lose the resource accidentally. So it saves us from basically all the problems from the previous slide. And here's the non-copyable struct. It's really simple. It just tells us that we can't copy the object or assign copy assign to it. Uh, OK, so who, ha who works or worked in a company that has its own string implementation? Yeah. <laughs> One is enough. Let's not talk about more. Uh, so this modern C++ is all about reusing standard library components. So libraries are programming generically and using uh, idioms like uh, policy-based design. So let's start with this one. So here we have a class which uses a overflow policy. We pass it as a template. And the trick is that whatever class you pass here must have this check function. And the overflow policy check will be called in this treasury. When I will add some funds, we will check if, if there will be an overflow or not. And if uh, the check allows, we will add this amount to the treasury. So here's the policy we have. The check function is pretty simple. So our Robinhood policy simply steals the amount if, uh, it's, if it would overflow. And we have our Nottingham treasury, which uses our Robinhood policy. It's really as simple as that. And you can customize uh, class behavior with this, like you would do with a strategy in some object-oriented languages. And about reusing existing libraries, we have lots of uh, places to look for fine libraries. We have Boost, which all C++ developers should know. We have Upsail from Google, which allows you to use more modern features, even if you are tied to a older language standard. So they have this policy to support up to five years back. And uh, if you are missing some features from 14 or 17, and you are still using C++ 11, you can check out AppSale. It should help you being up to date. EASTL, mm, Bloomberg's standard library, and are, are two implementations uh, of similar to the standard library from Electronic Arts and Bloomberg. And Foley is Facebook's library with lots of uh, utilities, all C++ related. And if you can't find something you're looking for in those libraries, you can use Conan, which is a de facto package manager for C++, de facto standard package manager for C++. So it's really simple to use Conan. You just create a file with the dependencies you need. You specify what generators do you want to use. And um, then you just run Conan install, and you use the generator. Oh, up on, so if I'm using CMake, so I need to have, a, have my CMake list. And we have this Conan basic setup here, using the CMake targets, targets approach, which is the preferred way from CMake 3 onwards. 
And uh, once I have those, I can just link to my library like this. And for those who don't know this, uh, CMake will also handle includes if we use the target link libraries. So we don't need to do it. And once we have this, we can just install the dependencies using Conan and run the CMake generator. And here we are. H here we have our library ready to be used. So with templates and metaprogramming, it's really not that hard to write many templates. And uh, this is a 98, C++ 98 way to write a factorial function, which will call itself recu recursively and calculate the factorial. So we have the um, recursive call and the base call. And in compile time, we will have the result. And it turns out with newer standards, C++ really goes more and more into compile time computations to shave time off of runtime. And uh, const expr is, or const expr functions are a great way to achieve this without templates. So from the new, in the newer standards, instead of writing that template, we could just write this function, which looks just like a regular function and uh, it will be executed in compile time. So no runtime costs uh, will occur most of the time. And uh, this shows that the language really ha wants to get to, to have compile time features easier and easier. And uh, another thing from modern C++ is uh, that it's uh, not the object-oriented imperative style language as it used to be. So with generic programming, we have templates. We can, most, of the, most of the standard library is based on generic programming. So it's a different programming paradigm than the object-oriented. They can mix mm, in a way. But C++ really allows for generics. And the auto keyword is a way to, to have generic uh, variables, let's say. Uh, template metaprogramming is also a way to have generic programming and const per functions, as we saw as well. C++ also allows you to write declarative code. So the ranges library from Eric Diebler, which will come into the standard soon, are a way to write declarative code. So here is an example, a clever way to print out the year that Rome was built. So we have the, some lambdas which will help us. We take all the ints. It's an infinite, I believe, uh, range of ints. We can just say to filter it, just the even ones, to drop one element, take the next three, reverse what we have, put it into a string. So it's really, you say what to do and not how to do it, and it just works. And. Uh, this is the declarative style, and it's really, I think, beautiful. Uh, another style that C++ allows you to program in is the functional style. So here we can have, uh, we have lambdas our fir as first class citizens, and we can also write higher order functions based on lambdas. So this is a function that does, does some work on another function, this compose. And summing this up, modern C++ results in safer and cleaner code, which we can develop faster and which will run faster as well. And it really goes well with C++ standards that came out recently. So let's talk about how the language evolved. I think we would we'd like to skip the past because all of you probably know it. So the game changer was the 11 standard, which introduced move semantics which was about uh, passing ownership between objects using std-move, which could aid performance and also allow for some new classes to be implemented, like the unique pointer. So with this smart pointer, we know that only one of those unique pointers will have the ownership. There's also the shared pointer, which allows for shared ownership, but it doesn't use move semantics. And uh, we can avoid many copies using those. Okay. And with, with C++, another feature that came in 11 is variadic templates. 
So it's templates with variable number of the arguments. It can allow for creating tuples. If you are using C++ 11, you could write a function like make unique um, from 14 very easily. So this is a basic implementation. Basically, it told, uh, this one just takes all the arguments it got, forwards them into a new type, creates a new object of this type T, and returns it in a unique pointer. Another addition to 11 was initializer lists, so it's pretty intuitive. You can just create a list with some things, or create it in place, and have it uh, pass being passed to a function. You can also create maps more um, intuitively by just passing the keys and values like this. Another important feature, especially for compile time com computations, are static assertions. So those allow you for compile time checks with simple error messages. So in this case, if uh, t is not an arithmetic type, then we will have a compile time error. Or if we are using so doing something on multi-platforms, 32 and 64 bits, we will get an, ex uh, an error at compile time instead of strange behavior at runtime. Another addition was the auto keyword, and it's more than just a tool for, la for lazy programmers. It allows for automatic type deduction, so it's like var and C-sharp, let's say, and we can use it for Correct, correctness to avoid ad accidental type conversions. We can use it for performance sometimes because you could iterate over a map uh, and it's easy to specify uh, mm, an invalid. Yeah, so, so we have a stack overflow question here with this. And the basic issue is that map stores pairs of const key and value, and we have. Uh, and, and usually when we iterate, we create a pair of key value. And this creates unnecessary copies, so it's a performance bug. And you can't forget to initialize an auto variable, so it's used for safety as well. Another addition were lambda expressions, which I showed you a bit earlier. And uh, since now functions are first-class citizens, we can do a lot more with them. A uh, great way it uh, changed the language is that we can now in, in place state what we want to pass to standard like algorithms, uh, uh, predicates, or functors. Ranged based for loops, which you may know from other languages, I think those are also a handy addition. And there are also lots more, like concurrency facilities, so threads, mutexes, atomics. The chrono library, which is a beautifully wrote, written piece of uh, template code, which allows you to do many operations on time. Mm, and some new containers were added to 11 as well, like array, which is a compiled time, time-sized uh, or sa safer mm, equivalent of the plain arrays. We have hash containers, like an ordered map and set, and we have tuple, which is a heterogeneous container. This means that it could store values of different types. And uh, then 14 came, so I won't mm, do much tell much about it, so the main improvement came from, I think, generic lambdas. So now you have lambdas that could uh, take an auto type. So it's a, it's a good, uh, so, so I think it's a good way to write a lambda that you could use with many types. There were also some bug fixes, but let's not go over those. So uh, C++ 17 came next with fold expressions, which can um, allow you to write even simpler template code. So if you want to write a function that simply multiplies all its values, all you need to do is just write this dot, 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 multiply args, and all the args will get multiplied. And context proof. So this is an old style way to write a Fibonacci function. It's maybe not the, the most beautiful, but it works. 
And uh, after 17, you could just write a compile time if statement. So I think it's uh, cleaner and does the same purpose. We can also have ifs and switch statements with initializers. So in an if statement, we could lock a mutex and then check uh, the value under the mutex. And the mutex will, since it's a scoped lock, automatically be released at the end of the if or the else clause. We can also have a switch statement with initializer. And uh, this really plays well with uh, structured bindings, which is another feature from 17. So we have this um, map insertion, which returns you an iterator and a boolean. So we can check this boolean right after. Uh, speaking about the library, variant is a very important addition. It's a type safe union. So unions, if, if you used plain unions with, let's say, an int and a string, then strings, uh, this really isn't a good idea because you will have a plethora of bugs with uh, because string isn't a simple type. With variant, you um, now eliminate such bugs because it knows that string is a more complex uh, type. Variant knows what it's was what's being stored and it will give you a compile time error if you are using it the wrong type that if you are having a type mismatch. And um, so it double is not stored in this variant, right? And if you are getting, if you are using uh, it at runtime, it will probably throw an exception if you call get, but there are also ways to check if what's the type that it stores. And variant allows you for visitation. So if you are familiar with the visitor pattern, variant is a way to have it in, C plus, in, in the C++ way. So here we have a generic lambda, which will visit whatever the types of the variant are, and sum or double them. And um, we can also write a struct for visiting uh, the variant, providing overloads for all of the types. We can also have a generic overload taking auto, and it will match all the other types not mentioned in the other overloads. We can also visit multiple variants. So you could match between, um, let's say you have a container and something in this container. So you could match those two types, for example, to be sure that you're using the correct container for the correct type of item. So I'm, not, so, so I'm speaking about, let's say, glasses and fluids, or cardboard boxes and cuts. You can write a double visitor, which just takes two variants and matches them. Another addition from 17 was optional. I think it's really important. And uh, let me ask you a question. What could you tell about this function signature? What does it do? Does it throw exceptions? It, yeah, it can throw exceptions, but does it? So we, we really can't tell anything, right? Even who's the owner of the data that's under this pointer, which is being returned. So how about this one? Is it any better? Yeah, it's not much better, but at least we know that it's not a pointer being returned. So we know that it's a simple int, no ownership problems. Still, we don't know if it throws or not. And how about this one? How do you think? Will it throw an exception or not? I mean, will it, will it, will it throw an exception or not? Yeah, it probably shouldn't. It uses an optional. So in case of error, it can just return an empty optional. So it's a clean way to signal that, signal to the user how exactly this function will work. And uh, in s we can have cleaner interfaces. We can also have optional uh, fields in classes. In case we don't want to give a nickname to a user, we can just pass nullopt and it will be empty. And also, um, for optional parameters for a function, we can also use this class. So here, the password expiration could um, be a thing or not for this specific user. 
Street View is another addition. And uh, I believe many of you had at least once written a function that had to take multiple string overloads, like const care star, std string, maybe const care star with length. And now you can just write one overload taking a string view. Often it will be possible and save you time and boilerplate. And another question, who thinks one of those functions is faster than the other and why? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. So here we have, in the, in the string example, we are passing a C string, but it needs to be converted to a std string. So uh, we will even have an allocation here, probably, because this, this string probably won't fit in the small string optimization buffer. And another addition for 17 was parallel algorithms. So we have several execution policies for many algorithms from the standard now. We can run them sequentially, like we did. We can run them parallelly. And we can even allow for or force vectorization. And it's really simple to use. You just use the algorithms like you always had, but you pass the policy as the first argument. Many of the existing algorithms, there's 70 a few here, so allow for par parallelization. There will also a uh, few new ones. And with that, let's move to the near future, namely C++20. And I think it's really exciting what it will bring. So one of the things are concepts. Concepts allow you for stricter type checking in templates. You can create overloads based on those. So let's say we have this hashable concept. It's an oversimplification, of course. But uh, we, can, uh, now you, we can now write a function which checks the template parameter if it's hashable or not. And it will give you a compile term error if it isn't. With the recent uh, C++ meeting, I believe the latest, uh, uh, the, the last line is also possible. So it's a uh, terse syntax. Oh, yeah, so it's a bug on the slides, but it's hashable, of course. And um, so speaking about uh, compile time errors from concepts or templates, let's say you write a, a function, a call to a function sort, which sorts the list. And suddenly you get tons of error boilerplate or bloat. And uh, you really, if you're not a veteran in C++, you probably won't scratch your head and wonder what's going on. So with concepts, you would just get, get those three lines saying that the list iterator is not a random access iterator. Clean as that. <coughs> Another important addition are contracts, which allow you for uh, checks before the call to the function and afterwards to check if no contract is broken. And uh, it's, it was previously named pre ex ensures and expects. Now it's pre and post. <laughs> it will. <laughs> oh, I thought, it, I thought the, the consensus was that it's, it's going to be voted. But OK, so I'm a a bit uh, ahead of, <laughs> yeah. And anyway, there are three enforcing levels for the contracts. Default, out, which is for lightweight checks, audit for heavyweight checks, and axiom for formal comments. They could be used, for example, by static analyzers or optimizing code. And um, <coughs> this can really help you writing safer code. So with coroutines, which are, is another C++ 20 addition. Um, we can write faster code, better suited for many purposes. So if you are familiar with Python and its generators, with 20 you can yield variables like you, do, yeah, like you did in, the, in, the, in Python. So this execution of this function will um, be stopped after yielding, and upon the next call to it, it will do another iteration of the loop. Another uh, usage for coroutines is just to, to 
mm, have better codes, let's say, when you deal with uh, long operations like I.O. So here, we, when we load resources, we can suspend the execution using co-await. It's an oversimplification, but it basically what it will do. And then uh, the execution could continue uh, uh, when, when the resource or line is loaded or fetched. Co-return is just a way to terminate the coroutine and return from it like normal return would do. Another addition will be modules, which is important for, uh, let's say, building. So this, the builds will now be scalable. Uh, the, the, instead of including uh, files and uh, having very lengthy um, code, we could just import modules. And it will isolate the files from macro effects. We won't. We and one one feature that I like about modules is that you won't need to duplicate code between headers and uh, CPP files. Avoiding duplication is always good. It could help the package management. And the caveat of that is uh, that the standard library won't be modularized mod modularized in C plus plus twenty. Some other features are ranges, the calendar, and time zones. Atomic shared and weak pointers, feature test macros, spaceship comparison, many other improvements. And to be decided if they will come into 20 or not are the formatting library, text formatting, flat map, and some additions for the ranges. So moving yet further with uh, C23, perhaps we will get reflection in meta classes. And uh, this is a way to generate classes of classes. So we could, let's say, define interface classes, like so. We can have requirements on such class types. So if they contain data, we will get a compiler error. We can augment the functions that we had, making all the functions public or pure virtual. This is just the syntax for applying it to the target function. And after writing such a meta class, we could just define our, our interface or use the interface to define, a, let's say, an instance named shape, which has an area member. Uh, another addition would be lightweight exception handling. <clears throat> so if you look at, let's say, 17's file system directory iterator, you would often have to duplicate code because one call would throw an exception and the other would return an error. With lightweight exception handling, we could just write that a function throws. It will throw a value, which will be passed on stack. If there's any additional payload, it will go into a pointer. So this would allow for much faster deterministic performance exceptions in the language. And uh, I think it's, it's really a simple syntax as well. Even a catch by fa value is fine. So speaking fa quickly about uh, ecosystem evolution, we previously had many problems with the language, like slow compile times, um, errors which were unreadable, hard to debug templates, memory leaks, and no central place to gain knowledge or spread knowledge. Now, after a few years, it's still getting better, but we already have Boost and other libraries. We have a package manager de facto standard, which is Conan. We have a de facto standard mm, build system generator, CMake. You could use Clang, which is a great uh, compiler for productivity. And uh, it really allows to develop software faster, giving readable errors and both Clang and GCC use sanitizers, which can help you uh, pinpoint an issue with memory or thread safety or allocations or undefined behavior. We also have uh, Metashell, which is a utility to debug template instantiations. If you write lots of template code, it could get handy. And speaking about places to spread knowledge and gain knowledge, there's a lot of blogs, books, really hard to recommend one single place, but I think isocpp.org is a good start. So it's one of the links named here. 
And I think, yeah, <clears throat> I talked about all of those already. So with that, I'm open for questions.